for uh, attending our webinar today. Um, Kat Smith from uh, University of Toronto and IEA Bioenergy Task 43, uh, and myself, Brian Kittler with the Pinchot Institute, um, going to spend uh, an hour with you today and hopefully uh, have some time for discussion as well as uh, communicating um, what we hope is relevant information for all of your work. And the focus of today's uh, webinar is the growing trade in wood for energy uh, between um, North America and Europe and sustainability issues. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Uh, just real quick, wanted to acknowledge our uh, partners at IEA um, who contributed significant amount of time in um, uh, the workshop that we held in Savannah back in October, but then also the ongoing vision uh, related to uh, bioenergy and sustainability issues and uh, the science thereof. Also want to acknowledge our sponsors um, down there. Um, they uh, provided uh, funding and support of the workshop that we held. Uh, and also we had a very diverse planning committee that we worked with um, to make sure we had the right issues to discuss and get on the table. So with this hour, um, Kat's going to lead off talking about, uh, at the global level, um, issues with biomass trade and sustainability. Uh, we'll have a 10-minute Q&A period following that. Um, and following that, we're going to drill down at a regional level um, and focus on the southeastern U U.S. and even further down into uh, the Savannah workshop and the workshop study area of southeast Georgia. And to conclude the webinar, we'll have a 10-minute question and answer period. So during both of these Q&A periods, um, you'll note in your control, pan control panel, you have a, uh, a space um, that you can expand. Uh, with and, and actually enter questions into uh, the type message area in your uh, control panel. Um, you can actually type those questions as you as we proceed through the webinar, and we'll get to them one by one as, as quickly as we can during the Q and A. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last note for SAFers for foresters: you can receive CFE credits by attending this webinar. So, Chat, uh, just turn it over to you to uh, give us some global perspectives on sustainable bioenergy trade um, and uh, going forward. Okay, thanks Brian and uh, thanks uh, to all our participants for joining us today. I was really enthusiastic to see the, uh, the list of folks who are able to sign on today. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask our, uh, our driver here if uh, you all can see my slides that are up now showing the outline. Is that true Alex? That's good Tap. Okay, good. So this is the uh, this is the outline that I'm going to follow between now and, and 12:50. So we've organized this. So if you look at the bottom of this slide, you'll see the organization of these points that I've expanded in the outline here. We'll talk about the major drivers of uh, demand for bioenergy. We'll shift from there to actually looking at uh, at wood pellet trade. Then uh, try to put the uh, put bioenergy in perspective with respect to forest products industry in general. Uh, move on from there, looking at long-term greenhouse gas benefits, and uh, touch on some issues related to governance. And then I'll conclude with some points about uh, what Brian and I hope will be helpful in, in continuing this dialogue that's been started here and, and what we would do to go forward. So I'll finish then uh, with, the, uh, with the points that are at the bottom of the slide here. So the major driver that uh, I think serves well as a, as a starter for this conversation relates to our need to reduce uh, global emissions of CO2 by 50%. I, I really like this slide because it's one that shows um, the, uh, the top part of the curve that's shown here basically is one that we're actually exceeding now in terms of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions and it portrays the fact that you can see the arrow that I'm moving across the screen, the fact that we want to be on the lower curve. So there's a whole series of, uh, of technologies that are actually necessary to reduce our energy-related CO2 emissions substantially. 
And, and the question might be then, how is it the renewables component actually can, uh, can occur? So this is, this is really what we're seeing as the major driver globally that's been, been resulting in the action that we're going to talk about here and that our event in Savannah was related to. So moving on then, um, I, I think it's important to recognize that, uh, that what the contribution is that's, that's currently taking place um, with respect to, to what we're calling modern bioenergy and, and what the levels of, of global bioenergy production are um, per year. So right now, if we put this in, in exajoule terms, global bioenergy is estimated, estimated to be about 50 exajoules. Put this in perspective with respect to the United States, total U.S. energy usage is about 100 exajoules. Canada is about 10. We have about uh, one-tenth of the population. Therefore, we're, uh, we're, we're one-tenth of that level. Modern bioenergy, which uh, in this sense we're using to refer to, uh, to the developed world and, uh, and the context that's germane to this conversation is about 10 to 15 exajoules per year. Put that in perspective with, uh, with, with, with the forestry sector and with the agricultural sector. Um, our colleague Joram Berndez has estimated that if you look at global roundwood production, that's equivalent to about 15 exajoules per year. Um, and, uh, and ag is, is uh, arguably four times that large. So if you take all crop production and put that in energy terms, then that's about, about 60. Um, if you look at, at the need to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions with, with fairly major uh, fairly major bioenergy production systems, then, then, then the numbers at the bottom here show the scale that it would take um, that's been some of the IPC scenarios suggest that we could go to maybe anywhere from 80 to 190 exajoules per year. These, these are, you can see, I, I hope you can appreciate then how large these are with respect to current bioenergy production and how large they are with respect to uh, to the forestry sector or the ag sector. As you can see, we're talking about a tenfold increase in, in bioenergy production that, that might help satisfy these greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. One of the other points that, that we wanted to make at this point in the, in the, in the webinar is, is that the forestry sector is really large compared to, to current export of, of wood pellets. And so I put a number in here for the world exports of wood pulp, 2011 number, 53 million tons of world pulp were exported. This is equivalent to about one exajoule of power. If you look at the North American trade in wood pellets for 2012, estimated by Patrick Lammers and colleagues, that's about 3.2 million tons per year. That's about 0 0.06 exajoules. So you can see that relative to to the whole forest sector relative to wood uh, pulp exports. What we're talking about here for exports in wood pellets is actually small and certainly very small compared to what we might project demand might look like if, if bioenergy were to make a really significant contribution to this. So we thought that was important perspective here as we size this whole thing up. Let's look specifically at wood pellet trade. Patrick Lammers and colleagues have estimated uh, what the trade flows are for, for the world. You can see that uh, Canada and the U.S. are the major suppliers of, uh, of, of, of this trade. Um, trade flows here for trade is going into, uh, going into the U.K. and into the EU. Um, so this is where the estimate that I showed you on the previous slide of, uh, of a little over three um, million tons per year comes from. You can see that those flows are really large compared to flows of wood pellets from, from elsewhere. But this is the reason that we've got this transatic, transatlantic uh, trade flow taking place was the reason we wanted to convene the actors in both events that took place in, in Quebec in October 2012 and in Savannah this past fall. Let's put this uh, this this bioenergy production into perspective with respect to the, to the forest products industry. And I like this slide because it portrays kind of how the forest sector is organized now. So if we think about stands of timber that are being managed to produce a mixture of, uh, of materials that are going to sawmills and pulp mills, this, 
this would portray uh, what that flow might look like from a, from, a, from a typical hectare of land. Those mills then generate um, residual materials that also go into uh, production of energy. And so we have bark, sawdust, and other materials going in there. And, and uh, th these are very substantial flows. At the same time that we're generating these, uh, these what we call traditional wood products, we also generate a series of other residual materials in, in forests. And, and whether or not they're harvested now or not is, uh, is, is, is less important for this conversation than to portray that there is potential for these materials to meet our energy needs as well. Um, the, the one part that's missing from this slide that we perhaps might talk about is whether unutilized annual allowable cut or unused AAC might also be a, an assortment that could go into, uh, into meeting our demand for, for wood fuels. But, but the point here is that traditional forest products are, 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 are the major driver here, and that uh, bioenergy largely remains a marginal residual mill and harvest assortment that's coming out of forests. And at this point, the uh, the financial business plan that's driving the production of, of this uh, commercial roundwood then is the is the major driver for systems and 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 these uh, bioenergy systems have typically remained kind of a low cost marginal material that that may be coming out as a result of the investment that's taking place in our in our forest sector. So to put this in perspective in another diagram, I like using this slide developed by my colleague Jorf Björhedén, who's with Gokforst in Sweden. And it points out that at the point in time where the forest sector was supplying 50 terawatts of power to meet the Swedish energy demand, 80% of that was coming from byproducts um, from sawmills or black liquor and pine oil. So, so a total of 40 terawatt hours uh, contributing to this 50. The other materials basically were, were marginal. And, and for, for most of our developed countries, it, it remains the case. If you look at the uh, energy supply in Canada, if you look at the energy supply in the in the Finnish forest sector, Swedish forest sectors, it typically is is one where where manufacturing residues are are about 80 percent of that 80 uh, percent of that national supply. That picture hasn't changed radically. So so I hope that helps put bioenergy in perspective and 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 clarify then how how the forest sector is really the major driver on this. It's, it's demand for wood products that's really, really the dog that's wagging this. One of the concerns that's come up um, in this debate is whether or not uh, using forests as a source of energy actually is important and, and sustainable, and whether or not it uh, meets our interest in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that, uh, in, in, in my opinion, and, and certainly in conversation with colleagues, it appears that research to date supports this IPCC statement that in the long term, sustainable forest management aimed at maintaining or increasing forest carbon stocks while producing a sustained yield of, of timber, fiber, and energy from the forest actually generates the largest sustained mitigation benefit. So, so this is not a trivial statement, and it clearly points out how Substituting for fossil fuels is, is so important. At the same time that we're sequestering carbon and a variety of other longer life materials like solid wood products and so on. So, so this statement appears to be one that, uh, that, that still holds true. And, uh, but we have to put this in a life cycle context. And so uh, what we start to have to do is, is to look at the full life cycle then for uh, for, for the products that we're generating. We've got to have careful attention given to then quantification of what's going on on the land and the biogenic emissions. What are the emissions uh, that are taking place in production and processing and, and use of these biofuels? And, uh, and what are the disposal? Um, how, how do we quantify um, materials that, that actually come out of the system as well? So there's general agreement that this kind of an approach is one that's important quantifying what the atmosphere sees. But frankly, there's a lot of debate about the specifics of this and the, uh, and the actual magnitude of the various pools here. So there'll be continued dialogue related to that. And this is certainly one that uh, we feel is one of the go-forward uh, conversations that's important. I'd move from that to a, uh, 
a uh, couple of slides, uh, one slide that came out of a report that uh, Annette Cowley and others uh, worked on that was published as an IEA bioenergy executive uh, report. And it's one that, uh, that portrays what forest carbon stocks are like over time at the stand level and at the landscape level. And, and two points emerge from, from this kind of analysis of, uh, of, of the contributions of forest bioenergy to, uh, to, to reducing our greenhouse gas benefits. One very important point here is that the long-term greenhouse gas benefits of, uh, of these bioenergy production systems are very substantial and do accumulate over time. So if you look at the net greenhouse gas savings that accrues, as a result of this, because of, uh, of greenhouse gases that are avoided by switching from fossil fuels to biomass. This is a really important trend line that we need to track on. The other point that's come out that's actually very contentious and is, is part of the debate now relates to this short-term delay and the timing of the mitigation. And as colleagues will know that are involved in the call, this the length of time over which this delay and the timing of mitigation um, comes out is actually quite contentious. Some have estimated it could be as short as five to six years. Others have estimated that it might be as long as perhaps 50. Some have estimated that it might not close, depending on what the fossil fuel reference system is. And so what this kind of analysis brings us back to is the points that I put in the upper right-hand corner here, which is the significance of, one, what the long-term net benefits are, Two, the importance of forest ecosystem dynamics. Three, the role that forest management plays in determining how stands are managed over time and how carbon actually sequestered at, at the stand level and at landscape levels. Um, identifies the importance of what the feedstock source actually is, whether we're using residues or unutilized standing trees as unutilized AAC points out the importance of the fossil fuel reference system and what its energy density is, because that's what's so critical in generating this upper curve here. And then finally, what the importance is of time. So, so this is a topic that uh, certainly needs much more discussion and debate, but a few points are emerging. One is, is depending on these variables here, the long-term greenhouse benefits can be very substantial. Let's move on to the topic of governance, because at the end of the day, the question is, what are the standards that we're looking to enforce? How is it that we define sustainability? And how can we have confidence that, uh, that the standards are actually being achieved? Those who've been involved in this conversation will know that governance actually takes several forms now, from strictly enforced regulations to international sustainability standards to guidelines and BMPs at the jurisdictional level in North America, at the state level and provincial levels, and also includes voluntary market-based certification systems. So, so, so the focus now is on really on, on, on the whole picture, but, but at the stand level and at landscape levels, do we have confidence that these landscapes are being managed sustainably? Or is our demand for bioenergy actually resulting in in, in depletion of resources, loss of biodiversity, um, and in, uh, in pollution of water supplies? And can we count on greenhouse gases being recycled back in ways that actually sustains carbon stocks here? Right now, there's, there's several approaches being taken. And part of the debate then relates to whether or not we're actually going to be ring fencing no-go areas and, and saying that there are certain areas that just can't be managed for bioenergy production at all, or whether or not we actually have confidence in the sustainable forest management systems that have been defined that actually would, over time, deal at a complex level with the design of, 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 of management systems, of operations that can actually sustain the values that we're looking to achieve on the landscape. And I think that this certainly appears to be the topic area that needs a lot more discussion. and. I'm enthusiastic about the way in which our dialogues have opened up uh, discussion of the relative value of these governance mechanisms in achieving what we're looking for here. I'll finish up then with uh, this topic of governance by pointing out that uh, the growth in, in, in certified forest area has actually been fairly substantial over time. 
and uh, and 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 just a couple graphs here showing uh, the PEFC and and FSC trend lines for that certified land base. But let's realize, colleagues, that only 10% of the globe's forests now are, are under certified sustainable forest management. So this means that uh, clearly demand for forest products and demand for um, for bioenergy will will clearly exceed the certified land base. So one of our challenges here as we look at governance is how do we get real-time growth in certified trade flows? If the certified land base isn't capable of supplying this demand, then how is it that we might look at other mechanisms, um, um, fiber sourcing programs or other kinds of things that might actually increase the flow of certified trade? So this is a topic that will we'll need more discussion. So I'll finish up with some going forward points here. We feel there's a, a, a big demand then for continued dialogue and that research to underpin this is critical. And I'd summarize this in maybe three major topic areas. One is that there's a need for continued dialogue and certainly more research on the impacts of the anticipated bioenergy demand on forests and on, on forest product markets. There's clearly a, a need for more dialogue related to greenhouse gas benefits of bioenergy. Just point out there's an event planned for Copenhagen in, uh, in May that we'll, that we'll discuss this and we'll focus specifically on, on uh, timing of the mitigation. I think it's been proposed that land use change be discussed at another time, perhaps in October in Brussels. And the third topic that I would suggest needs uh, much more discussion is, is governance. So, governance of, of, of supply chains, looking at what are the criteria, what are the institutional alternatives that uh, we need to be considering, and what are the procedures for verification and uh, of, of local and global trade. So with that, I've, I've gone a couple minutes over my allotted time. Let me turn it back to Brian and our, uh, our webinar driver to open it up for some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Tad. That was a, a very nice overview, and I think you you did well to uh, stay within the time, so that's great. Um, first question, Tat. Um, uh, do you see the future of bioenergy governance in Canada as requiring independent regulations or integration with existing SFM regulations? Many foresters express a desire to have minimal add-ons to existing laws rather than create a new regulation implicitly trusting in existing standards to maintain productivity, biodiversity, et cetera. So coming back to that question, um, is there a need for uh, a future bioenergy governance specific to Canada um, requiring new reg regulate, regulatory action? And perhaps that would be you know, at the federal uh, government level or, or the uh, provincial level. Yeah, yeah, good question, Brian, and, and really right at the heart of why we've wanted to have these transatlantic dialogues. The, the dialogue has indicated to me that there is respect for and appreciation of the uh, how comprehensive the Canadian systems are that are in place, provincial, um, provincial regs, uh, the way in which certification systems have been put in place. I think the uh, some 70 percent of the Canadian forest land estate is is uh, certified, and and it seems that there's been um, recognition of the importance of that as we look at, at certified trade flows. Whether or not uh, what what takes place in Europe and what the Europeans do with uh, defining some other layer of international sustainability standards, I think is is yet to be seen. Um, uh, it looks like the member states will come forward with uh, with some. Um, some approaches that will will perhaps recognize certification, and uh, and at this point, it looks like the effort that the Canadians have invested into uh, putting these systems in place is likely to be recognized as perhaps meeting the meeting the standard. But there's a lot more discussion and and, and dialogue that's required, and so we need to engage with our European colleagues to uh, to to see how this is going to move forward. I, I hope that's answered the question, Brian. Hello. Uh, thanks, Tat. Uh, we have another question here. Um, given that solid wood products uh, can provide greater mitigation benefits than bioenergy, 
uh, how does governance recognize this in uh, bioenergy criteria? Yeah, interesting question. Um, as as I've seen how how the math is done, a recognition of the value of, of solid wood products is certainly important. And uh, so as we look at how wood is substituting for cement or steel or aluminum uh, or other materials, that's that's very important. Um, but but bioenergy is also seen as as an important mitigation. Uh, Measure and and uh, substituting fossil fuels for for um, many biomass assortments and many biomass feedstocks is also seen as having really long term important mitigation benefits and 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 the challenge then is to is to deal with the time scales involved here because the longer you know the sooner we have energy system transformation and 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 the more that we have long term commitment to that. Uh, to that transformed energy uh, production system, then the sooner we'll realize the benefits, and the longer that the uh, that those mitigation effects will be in place. And so it's so it's not just one solution; it's making sure that the that we're maintaining forests globally, and that we're maintaining carbon stocks on those forests. It's it's making sure that there's uh, there is uh, high uptake of uh, of wood products and 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 use of wood products to uh, to offset more energy intensive materials and the substitution of, uh, of fossil fuels with biomass. So I'd see all those as being important tools in our toolbox here. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Tat. We have a, we have a couple more uh, questions here, but um, we've had one person who's actually raised their hand. Um, we're not going to be able to call on people um, to speak uh, through uh, their audio device. So if you can uh, just um, write your questions into the, uh, the question bar, we can, we can address your questions that way. Uh, okay, so the, our next question. Um, so what are the critical issues related to criticisms that using forest biomass would, would decrease uh, forest site productivity, which this is probably right up your alley, uh, Tat, as being a soil scientist by training. So, so again, Brad, I'm hearing that the question is, uh, what do we need to be concerned about to sustain soil productivity? Overall forest productivity, yes. <clears throat> yeah, so, well, overall forest productivity is going to be a mixture of both site factors as well as how stands are managed. But if we, in other words, the density, species selection, silvicultural practices, but if we focus specifically on on soil quality, then it's, it's clear that uh, that attention paid to maintaining soil physical properties will, will be important, that that, uh, that sustaining nutrient availability and nutrient supply is, is important. And so as we look at the research that's taking place within the context of the, the LTSP, you know, the, the long-term soil productivity uh, research program, those kinds of, uh, those kinds of empirical research programs that are testing hypotheses about the consequences of removing various assortments from the forest are so important for continuing to refine our site-specific knowledge of where we can actually take out various amounts of, uh, of, of material from the forest or not, or, or where fertilizers might be required to, uh, to replace nutrients that are, that are removed from the landscape. So we have to recognize that Forest bioenergy might come from from a wide range of management intensities, and know what the what the ways in which we need to manage our sites carefully are to to uh, to maintain productivity. So I hope that's helpful. I, I think certainly Brian, the uh, the whole concept of adaptive forest management. Let's put a plan in place. Let's monitor the response of uh, of the ecosystem to our management. Let's Make sure we evaluate the consequences of it, and if our theory was actually um, robust, and uh, make appropriate adjustments to our plans in the second rotation is is really the uh, the most logical, rational way to go forward. That deals with both uncertainty as well as uh, as active attention paid to monitoring variables that might change over time. So I hope that's uh, an answer to the question. Yep, that that's. Uh 
That's very helpful, Pat. Um, we've got a couple more questions, but I think we have time for one more, so we'll, we'll have to take them in order. Hopefully, uh, we can get at uh, the issues. Um, one of the other questions um, relates to the greenhouse gas balance question, uh, which I'll be touching on in my presentation as well. Okay. So, a final question for you, Pat. Um, is it practical to certify small forest owners, and does certification requirements isolate some of these owners from the markets? they depend on to maintain ownership of their forest? Well, the small landowner issue is one that's front and center in the whole debate now. There are mechanisms for bringing on, uh, bringing on smaller landowners, and uh, there's group certification. There's a variety of mechanisms that could be used for that. But I'd have to say that, that from my own personal perspective on this, I don't think the issue has been solved. And I think that if we can figure out ways in which we can one, attract more small landowners to the certified forest base, then that'll be an important goal for us. As you may know, in the southeastern U.S., it, the uptake is only 17 percent. And uh, and I think we need to be looking for some, some solutions to this. I know many of the uh, certification schemes have this front and center in their, their strategic priorities to get this worked out. So um, to get this to go to scale to to enable the uh, certified land base to increase and to enable all actors to be players in this. One to make it affordable. Two to make sure it's a fair. Three to make sure that uh, that this can go to scale is really critical, both for forest products as well as for uh, for bioenergy. So thanks, Brian. Thanks a lot, Pat. Um, so I'm going to shift gears. Take, <laughs> take the take the reins here, hopefully um, successfully. Okay, so can everyone see my slides okay? Is that coming up, Pat? Yeah, it is. Okay, perfect. Well, um, so the, the first point, or one of the first points that Pat made um, was the need to reduce uh, greenhouse gas global emissions by 50% uh, by 2050. And that specific uh, identified need um, by the IPCC and others has really driven policy in Europe, and specifically the EU 2020-20 mandate. So this is their climate and energy goal of uh, reducing their greenhouse gas emissions by 20% by 2020 and producing um, additional significant volumes of renewable uh, energy, both um, heat and uh, electricity. So what that has then translated into is looking at the various places in which where they are producing that energy and realizing that uh, significant imports of uh, biomass uh, would be needed to meet those goals. Uh, and majority of that is looking like it's going to be coming from North America, specifically Canada and the U.S., as Pat showed previously. So uh, trying to get a handle on questions of sustainability, um, global trade, um, you know, there's been a couple uh, dialogue sessions recently that, that drill down to um, regional questions and, and, and try to dissect these, these issues uh, at a finer scale. First in Quebec, uh, a workshop organized by IEA uh, and uh, TAT and uh, colleagues in Canada uh, brought together folks from around the world um, to get out in the field and debate these issues uh, in person. And it was really one of the first times that you had uh, the environmental sector, the energy sector, um, uh, private industry, government, everyone sitting around uh, in the same room uh, meeting face-to-face -face, uh, talking through these issues. Obviously the issues in Canada are very different than the U.S. and those in attendance from the U.S., myself included, really felt that another session was needed to focus on um, issues in uh, the main exporting region, which is the Southeast U.S. So in October we organized the event um, that we'll be talking about here. Um, we had 60 participants from nine different countries attend, representing really diverse interests, um, in, including those actively investing millions of dollars in this industry, and those also actively trying uh, um, uh, or publicly stating that they uh, are very uh, much opposed to it. So as you can imagine, the conversations were very interesting. We have a workshop report available at that website link here, um, as well as uh, over 20 uh, PowerPoint presentation, so I would encourage you to, to uh, log on and download those if you can. 
So just the structure, it was a two-day event. Uh, we had five sessions on the first day. Uh, the second day was a field-based study tour. Uh, we got out and looked at both uh, non-industrial forest land uh, in the southeast and talked with a uh, family forest landowner, um, asked questions related to uh, certification, um, uh, and they were interested in, in that as well, and, you know, they're, the importance of markets to their decision-making. Um, also visited with uh, Plum Creek on uh, their corporate uh, industrial timberland and really got a sense for the growth rates and the type of forestry in the region. Um, this is the coastal plain of Georgia, uh, the area we looked at. Um, the average age of trees, or the majority of trees are, um, uh, I'm sorry, 61 percent of trees in this region are 25 years or younger. So it's a very dynamic landscape. Um, majority is pine plantation. Um, you can see here we tackled various issues related to um, projected growth and demand for biomass from the southeast and what sort of response we are currently seeing and potentially see in the future. Um, overall sustainability issues with, related to the southern forest system and also um, sustainable forest ma management questions related to private forest landowners. Um, the concept of needing uh, practical and easily, easily measurable um, sustainability indicators so that uh, when we're looking at new regimes related to uh, biomass sustainability criteria being developed in Europe, um, how effective can, and readily implementable are those um, at scale in the U.S. Um, and then finally, we had a very focused debate uh, related to the biogenic um, uh, and combustion emissions of forest bioenergy systems, trying to advance that dialogue. Again, uh, a meeting in the southeast was really needed at this time uh, that would pull together these various stakeholders. It's the largest wood pellet producing uh, region globally. Uh, very different context in Canada, as I, are, as I already mentioned. Uh, the southeast is dominated by private forest landowners. A big uh, segment of those are these family forest landowners, um, which, you know, uh, have various reasons why they're uh, owning and managing these lands. Um, they are uh, obviously influenced by markets, but that's not the only thing that they care about. Um, and culturally, the South is, tends to be uh, um, embrace non-regulatory approaches to forest management, which is something uh, that's culturally different than uh, approaches uh, taken in Europe. So it makes the conversation pretty, pretty intriguing. Uh, as Tad already mentioned, um, we have a situation in the Southeast where currently 17 percent of the forest land is uh, certified, um, and 16 percent by uh, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative and the American Tree Farm System, and 1% by the Forest Stewardship Council. Uh, a very different context than in Canada. And again, you know, it's a very market-driven system. Um, over time, um, we've seen an expansion in uh, pine plantation acreage. Uh, in, uh, well, about the last 20 years, we went from 20 million to 40 million acres. And projections from the Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, um, say this is likely to increase going forward. Um, how large of an increase um, it remains to be seen, but uh, you know the, the projection is that there would be an increase. And it's of relevance for our conversations in Savannah because what's the role of the energy market in all that? Um, and um, you know the the graphic here is interesting. This is actually a, a study by the University of Maryland um, where they looked at uh, satellite imagery around the world to paint a picture of forest gain and forest loss. So you see the southeast here uh, where we're having uh, lots of uh, forest uh, lost and, and gains routinely. And what that basically means is that it's a very dynamic landscape with lots of forest, active forest management going on. Um, it's uh, probably the most intensively managed landscape uh, on Earth. Again, in the south, uh, because of that, we're, we're producing about 60 percent uh, of uh, the timber that is entering the marketplace uh, for uh, domestic consum consumption and export. Um, tremendously strategically important for the U.S. from an economic perspective. 
Um, it's also tremendously important from a biodiversity perspective, um, being the most biodiverse uh, region in the country, and also uh, most of North America. And particularly, a uh, couple segments and land cover types of, of concern related to pellets um, that have come up in the dialogue are uh, longleaf pine um, in the foreground here in this image, um, and also bomb and hardwoods, which have been a, a significant uh, uh, issue of controversy related to, uh, to wood pellets to date. Um, so stepping back, I mean, looking at sustainability issues again in the in the region, um, perhaps the major issue, however, is that we're scheduled or projected to lose between uh, 11 and 23 million acres of forest land uh, in this century, and that's outright loss to other land uses. Um, and the Forest Service is uh, predicting that that loss, uh, based on the market-driven system, occurs when we've got weak forest product markets. So we've got some significant changes that have uh, evolved in the global um, uh, pulp and paper industry, uh, of which the Southeast has traditionally been a major player. Um, and we also have this emerging bioenergy market. Um, the Forest Service is uh, projecting that that market, the energy market, will be the largest new source of demand in the Southeast for fiber. Going forward, uh, the EU is expected to import at least 20 million metric tons annually by 2020. And that is not all scheduled uh, or thought of coming from the US exclusively, obviously, um, but that is indeed the volume. Um, going out beyond this, it could increase to as much as um, 60 million metric tons by 2030. And actually, 2030 reminds me that I should mention that while the EU has a policy goal of uh, 20% uh, renewable energy production by 2020, they're already moving forward with looking at uh, setting goals for 2030. So um, they're seeing what's happening um, as far as energy production as being achievable and wanting to go forward with um, setting additional targets. So in all this, in the region, um, what came out in Savannah is there's pretty clear uh, lack of understanding among all the players about how additional pellet demand is going to affect forest management going forward. There's lots of economic projections. We know a lot based on past activity and how these markets function, but we don't know how big the market's going to be, and we don't know how that will uh, impact things such as new plantation acreage um, and uh, landowner uh, patterns of harvesting, for example. Um, and also, as Pat mentioned before, bioenergy is traditionally a marginal market. It's a low-value market. Um, but that's only to a point, and um, potentially with additional significant demand, um, at least one projection or, or scenario that the Forest Service looked at was a shift in uh, displacement of existing uh, users of pulpwood um, when an additional volume of demand of equivalent to somewhere on the order of 50 million additional tons would come online. So, you know, that's, these are long range projections. Um, it's uh, economic projections. Um, there's much uncertainty, but, you know, it's our best sort of approximation of, of looking into the future. Another uh, point that's to be made, um, you know, the South is very productive and you know, uh, they're, they're, it's important to underscore that while we are uh, traditionally at um, about even on growth, uh, growth and drain, um, there are opportunities to increase productivity in the region. Um, and investments in, in uh, plantation forestry, for instance, silviculture on uh, all lands is an important way to look at doing that. As far as uh, we talked about the de uh, growing demand uh, existing and projected, there's also a need, you know, to step back and look at where we currently are in terms of exports. So in 2013, um, the U.S. shipped approximately uh, 2.7 million metric tons of uh, pellets to Europe. Um, so you know, we're right about 3 million tons, and going forward to 2020. Um, at least one forecast is thinking that we'll probably double that by 2020. Um, so 
So we're we're seeing growth, but again, uh, to Tat's point, it's still still rather small when you're looking at the overall wood products trade. Again, um, we're looking at this region because it's uh, tremendously advantageous from a logistics perspective, and there also appears to be opportunities um, to utilize additional roundwood. Um, however, in all this, all these discussions around overall uh, sustainability from a, from a uh, productivity perspective and from a growth to drain perspective, um, workshop participants were quick to point out that if we just focus on growth to drain, uh, we're really not looking at the whole sustainability picture. Uh, when you are establishing a new uh, wood using industry, looking at uh, areas of high biodiversity where you're likely not to be harvesting uh, wood for wood pellet supply, um, looking at current volumes and end uses, uh, certified volumes versus non-certified volumes, um, and, and potentially you know many other factors, that's really important to factor in. So the criteria that have come out or are being discussed in Europe at both the EU level uh, within the European Commission, um, the member state level, and within the industry, they all center on several factors. And you know they're all a little different, but greenhouse gases are certainly a component, um, minimi minimizing gases along the supply chain, uh, biodiversity, um, the criteria want to avoid areas of high biodiversity. Uh, wetlands is also an issue. Um, maintaining carbon stocks in uh, forest regions is, uh, is a pretty significant issue. Chain of custody and uh, third-party verification that um, these practices are, are, are being followed or that supply chains are following these practices. Again, uh, there's these ongoing processes right now with the at the uh, European Union level, uh, we're not likely to see any new legislation or activity coming out before 2015 when a new European Parliament is elected. Uh, that said, it may very well be that the Commission, uh, in its current form, uh, comes out with a communication statement that basically uh, summarizes what has been done to date on European level finding sustainability criteria and makes recommendations to um, its next body to adopt um, or move forward with uh, a process. At the same time, several member states are moving forward, um, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, and uh, the UK, uh, most of all. Um, the UK is actually uh, fairly advanced in uh, developing their framework. Um, and I would recommend that you uh, take a look at our workshop report where we, we delve into some detail about uh, what that framework uh, is. and, and and what will be uh, uh, asked of forest landowners and uh, with pellet suppliers. And then there's also this uh, Sustainable Biomass Partnership, which is a coalition of seven European utilities um, looking to import biomass, um, looking to develop a, a program that would uh, establish procurement uh, practices for wood pellet suppliers in the US and Canada. And qualify for multiple markets, so uh, multiple end buyers, whether that's a member state criteria, uh, you know, pan-European criteria. Um, so they're trying to uh, develop a bit of a, uh, a meta framework. So as far as how do we uh, reconcile U.S. forest practices and programs for the forest sustainability with the intent of these evolving criteria, uh, a number of ideas came up in the workshop, which I think really bears some additional conversation. Um, how do we move from a voluntary uh, landscape uh, where uh, best management practices, largely for water quality protection, um, also look at some additional values such as biodiversity, um, and also deal with this question of third-party verification? At what scale do you need to verify practices that are being implemented? There's a lot of questions that need to be sorted out with that. Um, expanded use of controlled and sustainable sourcing. This is a term that um, I think we coined related to uh, both the Forest Stewardship Council's uh, controlled wood standard as well as um, SFI's fiber sourcing. Um, 
you know, they're both very different approaches, uh, but it's a way in which certified content is, is mixed with non-certified fiber and allows uh, for some assurances of um, sustainability. Do those programs have relevance to this new market? Would they potentially need to be certified, uh, be modified? Uh, group certification is potentially an option um, where you could uh, potentially enroll a number of landowners in, in the uh, supply area of a pellet mill, for example. Biomass harvesting guidelines are, are new. Uh, one state in the southeast has adopted them, South Carolina. Um, they address additional um, resource values beyond water quality of traditional BMPs and specific to biomass harvesting practices. Um, there may be an opportunity to bring new private capital into the supply chain to support sustainable um, forest management planning through programs like the uh, you know, state federal forest stewardship program. Um, and, you know, there's also this con concept of a risk-based approach. If we're going to have potential risks of unintended consequences related to this, this new demand, um, can you look at a supply area and um, uh, assess those risks and develop a, a program of, of potentially mitigating those risks? I think it's a concept that, uh, you know, has some merit and, um, both the Sustainable Biomass Partnership, but then also the UK government are, are, are investigating um, this approach as, in, as a concept. So, you know, the final uh, panel that we had in Savannah, um, you know, we've, we've, we've seen a lot of conversations and debate around the greenhouse gas uh, issues. Uh, currently, it's a hot topic in policy realms in Washington, D.C. Um, and it's been a heated scientific debate in Europe for a long time. So we did have some fairly clear areas of general agreement and areas where, you know, additional research is, is definitely necessary. However, I would argue that um, at this point, debate is going to be more important than additional research. Um, we need to have a more, uh, a broader and more developed conversation around these issues. And hopefully this Copenhagen meeting will be a, a good step forward in that regard. Um, there was agreement that, hey, we really got to get the math right, but it pretty much stopped there. Um, this agreement occurred when we looked at questions about, well, how do you frame, uh, how do you frame a life cycle study in a region like the Southeast? Um, do we factor in the economics of this landscape, and how do we do that? Um, do we credit forest landowners for activities they've already done or doing currently? A lot of questions came up, and we didn't really reach any agreement there. Um, and again, as Pat mentioned, very diver divergent re uh, views regarding the payback period. Um, some were even um, articulating um, you know, that, that there really is no payback period. There's a sort of a, an immediate carbon neutrality. Um, so that, 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 that position is still uh, being held by, by some. And others expressed um, that really no payback period is acceptable and that we should not be looking at bioenergy because it does have this, this timing issue, even though, as Tad pointed out, the long-term uh, benefits are significant. Uh, finally, you know, in this, in this conversation, um, we looked at uh, potentially the need to develop best practices within the industry. Is there an opportunity for um, science, for conservation, for academia, and uh, the energy industry to sit down and look at, you know, those different uh, avenues and, 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 and issues along a uh, life cycle framework and actually develop best practices where you can minimize your greenhouse gas output from a forest bioenergy supply chain. And I would really encourage you to take a look at the presentations associated with this panel in the Savannah workshop. We had some, uh, some really good presentations. So in that regard, um, you can go to the website here. Uh, we also have some photos from, from both days. Um, and on that greenhouse gas panel, we had uh, two presentations early on which offer a bit of a meta-analysis of all the scientific literature that's been out there on the issue of, of the timing and the mitigation of forest bioenergy. 
So going forward, um, should we be concerned about potential trade disputes? This is a, a question that has been kind of bouncing around in the back of my mind um, when I look at uh, both the, the uh, sustainability criteria that have been proposed in Europe and currently uh, the type of sustainability programs in operation in the U.S. Um, how much parity is there? Maybe we just need to spend some more time talking and piloting projects to see if we are actually meeting the intent. I would argue that we probably are, um, but I would also argue that we probably need to, you know, make sure that we are. And how do we move forward with imperfect information? Um, we don't have a clear picture of what the future is going to be. Um, clearly, there could be some unintended consequences. Um, and clearly, there's going to be a need for more dialogue around this. Uh, what's the best way to pilot test procurement pathways and crosswalk standards with um, uh, activities currently undertaken with forest landowners in the southeast, uh, with the pellet mill uh, and the energy industry? Um, I would posit that there's a real need to have some on-the-ground tests of these systems um, before broad uh, deployment. And, uh, you know, Savannah was great with the broad spectrum of participants that we had. However, um, the, there's a real need to deepen the conversation and the dialogue um, and anchor it on science, but also broaden the community of actors that are engaged in this dialogue. Um, if we're going to find practical and meaningful solutions, um, that's going to be an absolute uh, necessity. So uh, I'd like to open it up for, for questions now, and um, this is the, the last. This is going to be available on the Pinchot Institute website, um, so you'll be able to uh, share this webinar, recorded webinar, with folks as well. Okay, so we have a question here. Please explain the community of actors. So I, in Savannah, um, for instance, we had uh, in the room, sitting around the table, um, the conservation sector, academia, uh, state agencies, uh, federal agencies, the uh, forest, traditional forest products industry, uh, pulp and paper, solid wood products, um, energy utilities in Europe, um, uh, pellet mills in the southeast. Um, you know, I, I think there's a need to really focus on the controversial issues that remain um, and potential solutions. And that's going to really direct us to who else needs to be at that table going forward and what's the appropriate forum to have the conversations. Um, there's been opportunities in the past uh, when there's been uh, contentious issues, say, within the traditional forest products industry where science has been brought to bear through um, uh, consultative processes involving lots of other uh, interests to start to find some solutions. So I think that something like that could emerge here going forward. Uh, next question, do you envision a market-based incentive for landowners to receive higher stumpage for biomass products if they're using one of the formal certification programs? So that is certainly one opportunity. Um, there's actually a facility in uh, Florida, uh, the Gainesville uh, utility, which is providing a price premium um, to forest landowners if they're, um, I think, believe if they're adopting FSC certification and possibly some other uh, standards that, that, that they concocted. So that is, you know, there's a precedence for that. And, you know, with it being a market system, uh, certainly some type of uh, market incentive would, would be useful there. Um, Another question, is the U.S. the free enterprise system? Uh, okay, why should we invest in these extra costs if there isn't a premium? Well, I think that's, uh, that's well taken. Um, 
I, I don't think we're going to have forest landowners and pellet mills investing in sustainability measures um, if uh, there's there's no incentive for them to do so. So that's that's kind of what we're wrestling out here is uh, how do we uh, um, mesh up the criteria that have been developed with providing a new incentive in either you know the price of the pellets or uh, you know additional investment in in their in their forests. If forestry in the south, if forests in the southwest, southeast are lost, as the U.S. Forest Service is predicting, uh, what will they be converted into? Um, well, traditionally we've had sort of um, uh, both agriculture and uh, suburban urban development as sort of the main additional land uses. Um, right now, with commodity prices, or in the last year or two, uh, we have seen some lands divert into agriculture. Um, and, you know, I think going forward, uh, sub, uh, urban development, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, that's going to be, a, that's going to be a big one. Coastal plain, incidentally, um, is one of the main issues in which that development is uh, pr predicted to occur. It's also one of the uh, main uh, areas in which this uh, market is developing. Another question here, you mentioned that the U.S. is looking into a risk-based approach to verification of sustainability. Which form will that take, and can you say something more about this? Well, actually, I may have misspoke. Um, currently, it's not the U.S. that's looking into that. Um, I think believe that the Sustainable Biomass Partnership um, is interested in a risk-based approach. I really don't know much about, about that. I'd be intrigued if anyone else on the call does. Um, it would perhaps uh, provide some additional information. Um, I, I believe that the scale at which you implement an approach like that is going to be really important. So if you have something that's too broad, it becomes really not useful, um, and likewise if it's too narrow. So getting that scale right is, is going to be really important, and constructing um, the approach is also equally important. Another question, were there suggestions about what type of research is needed to resolve questions about carbon accounting? I'd have to look back at our, specifically about the notes about, um, from Savannah about specific additional research. Uh, but as I, I commented, I believe that, I personally believe that there's been a lot of research. Um, what hasn't occurred is uh, the type of learning, I believe, about what that research is, is, is telling us. And uh, debate, uh, you know, uh, civil debate about that research, and examination and analysis of the research is, is going to be critical to understanding, um, you know, how we how we look at the forest bioenergy supply chain and uh, its implications for the atmosphere. Uh, additional question. I mean, that's my that's my personal view. Uh, a couple more questions. Um, has Europe engaged uh, the Forest Service uh, either? Uh, State at the state level or uh, federal level uh, as a resource for data on sustainable harvest for the forest. Uh, private for uh, I'm sorry. Let me restate this. Has Europe engaged uh, the U.S. Forest Service um, to look at uh, harvest levels of non-industrial private forest landowners? Um, I believe that the uh, industry is very much engaged looking at um, FIA. And that is one area where we uh, got into sort of pretty deep at, in Savannah, um, you know, the need to, to look at FIA and, and, you know, be careful about how you use those data. Um, and we had a nice uh, set of presentations um, from a few uh, economists who, who kind of showed um, changes in forest inventory and harvest levels over time, um, which kind of, uh, you know, and, and they did it in a spatially explicit manner. So um, I, that's a conversation that's actively happening between industry and, uh, and the U.S. government, for sure. So uh, we have one additional question here. Uh, if growth and demand increases on the scale forecasted, might other players enter the market, such as South America? And what threats might uh, this represent? to the southeast U.S. So I, it's, a, it's 
it's an interesting question, and you know, I think when you look at sustainability, sustainability globally, um, and uh, you know, tap the slides from Patrick Lommers, and, and tap, feel free to jump in here. Um, this is already a global market. We've already seen uh, supply coming from multiple places. Uh, the strength of the criteria in Europe, um, it, you know, is going to is in, in some part going to dictate where that supply comes from. Um, but clearly, they're you know they're looking at the southeast as the main supplier. And as the industry grows and contracts get signed, um, you know, it's going to bear out. It'll be interesting to see how um, just how the volumes actually actually play out going forward to mid-century and whether uh, Latin America and other parts of the world uh, would get into this, uh, into this trade in a big way. I think that's a good answer, Brian. I do think that uh, we need to be aware of growth rates in Brazil and, uh, and already the significance of, of them as a production region for, for pulp globally. A lot of mills are being supplied from, uh, from South America now. Tap, maybe you want to comment on the, uh, the previous question as well related to uh, additional research needs on carbon accounting. Well, I think uh, there's, there is still pretty intense debate going on. Uh, your points about uh, framing the questions are, are, are still pretty critical. And, uh, and just how various, uh, various reference systems are accounted for is where a lot of the debate's playing out now. Getting back to a question that was asked to me earlier that I don't think I actually answered correctly, it related to forest products and the significance of these and whether or not they're, they're recognized in the, uh, in the accounting. I don't see the certification systems actually including that uh, to the degree that they might, but our dialogue this morning planning the Copenhagen event for May indicated that actually tracking on forest products through our economies and all the way through disposal is, uh, is something that's actually pretty important for getting the reference system right. So um, another significant research need is on the biogenic <coughs> emission side. Uh, you know, one of the questions we might ask is how thoroughly have we evaluated our, our different forest ecosystems and, uh, and in different silvicultural systems to quantify what that uh, what biogenic emissions are like and what the rates of sequestration are. I think there's very substantial need for for research in those areas, and also in uh, life cycle assessments for for various uh, production systems. But especially when we get into kind of quantifying the, the bioenergy system and comparing it with the reference system, that there's actually a need for both analysis on on kind of how the questions are framed and the framework for analysis, as well as on um, uh, basic research that's needed to kind of underpin our understanding of theory and the mechanisms involved. So very substantial research needs there. Hope that helps. Yeah, those, those, those were the, really some of the key issues that we wrestled with and, and discussed in, in Savannah and, and seem to be popping up time and time again yeah. in uh, various dialogues out there. Yeah. Um, we've got one last question, and you know, after I state it, uh, I have a couple, uh, a comment, but I think it's going to uh, prompt you, Tat, to kind of launch into a response as well. Um, so the question is, uh, is there any evidence that primary forest in the southeast U.S. is being used for bioenergy slash pellet production? It's a short answer uh, in that there is, there really is not any remaining primary forest in the southeast U.S. Um, we're all uh, at this point second, uh, you know, it's a second generation forest for us. Um, most of the eastern U.S. are, uh, we lost our forest through deforestation and they've since grown back. Um, and there's really no part of the country that's not directly um, uh, touched outside of the federal lands um, and specific segments of the federal land base. But being that it's a private landscape and it's very much um, Really uh, um, uh, actively managed. Um, it, it's sort of a non a non issue for us. But however, for Canada, Tad, I'll let you uh, touch on that because I know it's been a huge issue. Brian, I'll, I'll be be um, very frank and admit that for me um, professionally, the 
full conversation related to primary forests and the use of the term primary forests in this dialogue is is uh, is not very helpful. Um, I think that uh, you know as we think about forests having been inherited from nature, um, the, you know as as perhaps the definition of forests that haven't been affected by people um, in many ways ignores the fact that we've got Aboriginal communities that are living in them and they've been there for millennia. So. I, so I, I professionally am really challenged by the way in which that whole concept has been brought into this discussion and would prefer us to, uh, to be thinking in terms of trying to sustain values on the forested landscape and, and, and looking at approaches of either conservation uh, you know, versus active management at some other ends of the spectrum there to achieve specific values um, in the forest. Uh, context for the Canadian forest estate, uh, probably some half a million hectares of land are affected by natural disturbances every year. Um, so, so, so nature is very much in control of, of a lot of the landscape there and, and how this term primary forest might be used in productive ways to advance this debate I, I find really challenging. So it, it, but it has been a term that's been Quite, uh, quite concerning for the way in which it might be applied to, to the Canadian forest situation. <clears throat> uh, there's been attempts to distinguish between what we call in Ontario the area of the undertaking versus areas that are north of the 51st that are really outside of active management um, so, that, so that there's focus on the actively managed estate and, and sustainably managing that. Um, I, I think that in many ways the uh, I think we're better off kind of being more precise in our terminology and and not using terms that are that are as imprecise as primary forest there to advance this debate for how we want to sustain the globe's forests and all the attributes that would be uh, that would be important to us as a society to to maintain. So, so I hope that's helpful, Brian, in answer to the question. Yeah, I, and I think it it your answer speaks to the need to have these dialogues. Um, Make sure that we all under we're all trying to come on to some common understanding around definitions and um, and these issues. So I think we have one one last question, which uh, I'll address, um, and it relates to the uh, uh, life cycle accounting framework. And specifically, we 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 did not touch on um, GHGs emitted through uh, transport of uh, large volumes of biomass. Um, through shipping, uh, rail, and other means um, to port, and then across the Atlantic to Europe. Um, it's a it's a good question. It's actually one that uh, when you first look at this question of, of the uh, greenhouse gas uh, balance, life cycle balance, uh, would you would think it would be a big component of the overall emissions? Um, it's actually not not as large as some of the other. Uh, uh, areas of the overall life cycle, and it's one that we have a pretty good handle of as far as uh, you know the volume of, of uh, GHGs that are emitted through transport. So the 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 science and the and the questions and the debate is really centering on um, the sustainable forest management side of it. Um, at this point, you know what are what are the uh, uh, what are the emissions associated with um, uh, harvest with combustion um, and energy conversion, and also the sequestration period in which those emissions are resequestered in uh, new growth. So that's uh, how we ask, how we how we answer that question, and how we construct a uh, an analysis to answer that question is really where the debate is at at this point. So yeah, I think we're we're how small that is. <laughs> yeah, so so we, we are we're pretty much at the end of our webinar, um, and if we, if we don't have any other additional questions, you know, I would uh, I would welcome you to um, reach out to Tad or I offline and, and encourage you to review our report. And please do take a look at the presentations uh, from Savannah, and uh, stay engaged in this conversation. And thank you very much for attending. Thanks, everybody. Bye, bye.